weeks ago, um, my car stopped in the middle of the road in uh, the city of Abuja. Um, I was on the passenger seat and my brother Hermes was driving. And uh, we managed to pull over. It was a busy road, you know, cars coming and going. Uh, it was about 10.30 p.m. And I realized two guys were coming towards us. Uh, they were scouts. They wanted to come and count the cost. What would they get? Laptops, phones, and... Well, fortunately or, un or unfortunately, I had my phone and Hermes had his phone. Uh, so they saw that. And two laptop bags were at the back seat. And we could hear them. So one of the scouts was arguing, um, maybe it's another person lying down. They weren't sure. So these two guys went and they came back with three more people, five people. And uh, they had a big stone and they kind of gave us a warning that open this window one, open it two, and on the third count, they put the, gra uh, the, the stone through the glass and it kind of shattered into us. Uh, all over Hermes' beard and all over me and my pocket, glass all over. Now, what happened was uh, a kind of a revelation because I saw the glass um, after the event, which I'll tell you later how they got away with no phone and no laptop but blood. Um, I kind of looked at the glass and thought, this was on a window pane or a windscreen, right? And it certainly isn't in the form that it is right now as it's shattered. And at a, at a point, it wasn't what it is right now as a shattered glass, right? And I remember this theory or psychology concept called, called Gestalt. In German, Gestalt translates directly to the unified whole. And you may, if you may have heard about Gestalt, uh, some of us that have, uh, it's erroneously translated as the whole is greater than the sum of its part. That is wrong. It actually means the whole is different. It's other. It's something else than the sum of its parts. Now, if you look at the apparent dog you see on the screen, uh, imagine if it was formed with those glass pieces from, from my unfortunate event. Uh, it certainly doesn't mean that when you add those glass pieces, you get the picture of the dog, no? Uh, but the whole that is this current picture is totally different from the sum of the parts of the glass that forms the dog. Now, to give you a better understanding uh, or example, you clearly know what this is, right? The Olympic symbol, right? And uh, what your mind shows you here is the simplest, uh, the simplest explanation that you could ever give. That's the five circles that are interlocked. But it's technically impossible to have five circles interlocked on 2D space, right? What you actually see is about 14 to 15 lines. So there's a line on the blue angle that goes all the way to the, to, the, to the yellow circle and stops there. And then there's a little yellow circles between the blue circle and the black circle. And then another yellow one that goes into the black circle and so forth till you have all the lines, 15 of them that form this. So it's actually not five rings that are interlocked but your brain gives you that closure. I like to believe that's exactly what happened to our robbers, because they thought there was a man in the back seat, right? Meanwhile, it's just a bag. But their mind told them that there was a person, right? So these kind of perception principles are what Gestalt is about. They are theories that work on our mind's perception in terms of proximity, closure, in terms of similarity, in terms of uh, space, and, and how objects relate around them. Now, I'm particularly interested in Gestalt because look at this example. It's just too random, right? But when you put it together, you get something like this. I got this from the WWF logo. Um, and, and it's interesting because look at those gaps. There's nothing there, but your brain, your brain fills it, right? You get the, thing, the feeling that there's, there's actually a picture of a bear, and you get the logo, right? Now, beyond visual representations and beyond what you see, what your mind tells you, Gestalt can be applied to a lot of things. And the psychologists that invented it in Germany, uh, I think in the 1920s, were particular about problem solving and Gestalt, not just in design. And I am particularly interested in this bit. 
Now, the essence of successful problem solving behavior lies in being able to see the overall structure of the problem. That's what the theory of Gestalt argues. Interestingly, in Gestalt, to look at a problem, you need to step away. You need to be able to restructure your perception of the representation of the problem, isolate it a little bit so that you can have that flash of brilliance that becomes the eureka moment or the light bulb moment. And according to Gestalt psychologists, problem solving is a productive process. Productive meaning it has to deal with isolating the problem, seeing its sum of its parts and looking at it as a whole, rather than isolating that part and, and, and treating it as a whole. And the opposite of this process is the reproductive process, whereby you go back in time and look at a solution that was used and try to apply it. I'll give you an example. The Ouroboros. In, I think, 1865, uh, a chemist called August Kikola had a dream. I know a lot of us know this, right? He had a dream of the snake eating itself. Now, for the most part of the years before that, we knew uh, the, the element um, or the, what would I call it? Benzene, right? Benzene, everybody knew that it had a structure, but nobody really knew what it was. We knew it form, it's formed by five um, uh, uh, atoms of uh, carbon surrounded by hydrogen, but nobody knew what it was. He knew that. Then he had this dream of the hydrogen atoms going in a cyclical motion, like the Ouroboros, like the snake eating itself. And voila, he gave us the actual structure of benzene. Now imagine if August Kekler didn't put himself in that problem-solving situation of looking at all the atoms that will form the benzene molecule. He knew that there are five of them. He, he knew that they exist, but he didn't know the structure, and then he had the dream. So that essentially, I'm saying there are no light bulb moments. There are no eureka moments. You cannot have a light bulb moment if you're not in the process of solving the problem. I will attach um, a relevant example of a real life problem. And I'm very happy that I was talking to one of the uh, speakers here before uh, about the conflict of Boko Haram in Nigeria. Now let's take the two examples of um, a productive problem solving process and a reproductive one. Currently, what are the problem solving techniques used by the people, the stakeholders involved in solving this problem? I think it's mostly reproductive. So they think back, when has this ha ever happened before? Let's take Metasina in Kano, right? Um, what did we use? We basically sent a bunch of soldiers, they killed the guy, and voila, problem solved. So they killed the first leader, just like we did, reproductive, but it didn't work, right? Now, what's the second thing we could use? So other countries probably, you know, uh, put more armories, you know, uh, buy more ammunition, get more soldiers drafted, put more people, get tankers, right? They did that, reproductive, did it work? Well, we're looking, it's not working so far. So what do we do? We need a productive answer. So we kind of need an August Kikola to kind of see all the atoms involved in, you know, the Boko Haram crisis so that we can have a solution. By the way, this is just an example, just like the Ouroboros. So, Essentially, what I'm saying is we need to understand all the parts that p come together to form the sum that's the Boko Haram whole, so that we can apply the Gestalt psychology in solving this problem. And I chose Boko Haram because it's big, it's complex. Now think about the smallest problems or the most biggest problems, you can still apply the psychology or the, or the process. Um, one thing that we've been working on is looking at agricultural data in my day job, right? And an outstanding revelation is some of the uh, most Boko Haram attacks happened in the villages that had the most rainfall. The data doesn't lie. So we see that there's rainfall here, and apparently in the dry season or after harvest, there's a Boko Haram attack, which points to one thing. They're after food, right? So that's one parameter. That's one atom, if you look at it. That's one part, the food angle. So what are we doing? Ammunition don't solve food problems, do they? And going back to bring a reproductive process does not solve a food problem. Now again, 
the desert is encroaching that part of Nigeria at five kilometers per year. So every year, five kilometers of desert encroach, and that means we lose farmlands, we, we lose vegetative cover. That's another problem, environment, right? So you begin to look at it. We talked about food. We talked about environment. We should talk about migration. We should talk about education. And I saw some work being done on uh, uh, preventive measures, on uh, extremism. That's also another angle, because some of the argument that these guys pose is that they are doing it for the purpose of the uh, spread of Islam, which is, you know, if you know Islam, completely bogus, right? So we need to look at that as well. So all I'm saying is rather than have a reproductive process of coming up with a solution to our problem, let's have a productive process. And uh, this kind of productive process can only happen when there's creative irreverence. And by reverence here, I mean total disregard and disrespect for the rules. We've seen how uh, OBJ talked about peace and basketball. I love that so much because I believe that in games and in sporting and other activities, it's where we are the freest. So in my workspace, in my office, and in my home, hacking is not a criminal behavior. I'd like to think, well, I'm not referring to you know, hacking your computers and doing some really malicious things, but I believe that cutting corners to get to a solution should be what we do. Just because somebody used force to kill Metas Ine and solve Boko um, uh, Metas Ine crisis doesn't mean we have to do the same thing. And this can apply to so many things. Based on this, uh, we started a new company, and uh, by the name of it, you know we're looking for trouble. We call it witchcraft. <laughs> it's witchcraft are you talking about? <laughs> so we started this, and uh, it's, it's an effort towards building companies that solve problems in environment, in water and sanitation, in agriculture, in automotive uh, sectors, you know, everything you can think of, but in a disciplined, controlled environment that allows for re not reproductive process of problem solving, but the productive one, that allows for implementing Gestalt principles at their highest, and that allows for the camaraderie that enables, you know, decisive and functional decision-making, other than what we're used to. Now, to go back to my story, what actually happened at the end of it is I asked Hamis, open the door, and he thought I was crazy. I repeated, open the door. He's like, there's five of them, and there's only two of us. And I said again, open the door. When they broke the glass, he finally opened the door. And the man looking at me saw in my eyes that he's probably going to die or I was going to die. <laughs> and I attacked him. And he fell down. And then Hermes picked the big stone that they threw in the, into the car, and he hit the guy that was right next to him. Next thing you know, they are charging over the highway. And in a moment of madness, I gave chase. Now, applying the Gestalt principle here also means looking at the two problems that we have. So my robbers had a problem. Their problem was they need to get into the car and get my phones or laptops or whatever we had in the car, right? Whether we like it or not, it's a problem. It's their problem, right? And I had a problem too. There are guys who want my stuff, my wealth, you know, <laughs> and probably my life. I need to solve it. So what do you do in a situation like that? According to Gestalt principle, all you have to do is realize that the sum of your part is totally different from your whole. You it's not an addition matter, right? You cannot add me and Hamis and a probable man in the back who is there or not there and get you know, an answer to, 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 to defeating five armed robbers. But what we had at the end of the day was a totally different scenario from, from adding you know, the three of us. And it happens. If you look at Gestalt, I think everybody that ha hasn't seen Gestalt before should give it a research, and you find out that it's actually an interesting, massive concept that I believe I've been able to kind of touch the waters on in this talk uh, uh, for less than 15 minutes. And uh, what I would end with is something that gave rise to the, the title of my talk. And uh, it's a saying by, I think, Edward de Bono that says, creativity involves breaking out of established patterns in order to look at things in a different way. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>